First of all, welcome to everyone. Um, I'm really glad you're able to join us tonight. I think we've got a great program lined up for you. Um, a real nice opportunity to hear behind the scenes uh, in the making of a documentary. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Scarlett Wirt. I'm the program committee chair for the National Railway Historical Society's Washington, D.C. chapter. Um, our mission is to share public appreciation and expand it for railroad history and railroads. And we do that through preservation and education. So we've got a whole lot of different programs. Some of them you may be familiar with. Um, we have three different railroad cars that we own and operate, uh, all Amtrak qualified. They're the N cars, Collinsville Inn and Franklin Inn, and then of course our beloved Dover Harbor. Uh, we sponsor uh, campers at Rail Camp. Um, we have an, a, a um, newsletter, the timetable, and we also have a railroad library housed in a railroad tower in Bowie, Maryland. So we use all of these things uh, to fulfill our mission. And another primary way that we ex uh, execute that mission is through our public programming, such as this program tonight. I'm very happy tonight to have Ridge Luckin with us to talk about the making of his doc documentary, Pullman, America's Hotel on Wheels. And I'm also very fortunate tonight to have with us historian John Hankey, who has been a longtime collaborator with us at DC NRHS and also a collaborator and friend of Ridge Luckin. So with no further introduction, I'll hand it over to John Hankey, who can introduce our speaker. Well, I thought I'd begin with a little bit of context. Um, railroading has always had great visual appeal. It's kinetic, dramatic, colorful, and varied. And in a few years, we will begin railroading's third century in North America, which means there has been plenty of time to accumulate stories and struggles and, and all sorts of interesting bits. Its history is vast and varied, but railroading uh, remember, railroading literally helped shape the United States. It made possible one country, it gave us our economy essentially, and it, it facilitated our modern way of life. We have not been very good at documenting that or presenting it or explaining just how important and interesting railroading has been. That's why it's such a great pleasure tonight uh, that Rich Luckin was able to be here, and uh, that means wherever here is to all of you out there. His railroad films are not casually done. They're not mere pictures of interesting trains and they are not rail fan videos, thank goodness. He brings a great deal to his projects. Training, long experience, and a very high level of craftsmanship, which is welcome if you've ever watched a casual rail fan video. His knowledge of an engagement with railroading is profound and deep He's one of us and has been for his entire life. But perhaps most importantly, he's a storyteller, a gifted storyteller. He's an explorer of sorts, a kind of journalist, a historian, and someone deeply curious of and bemused by human foibles, our desire to create things as improbable as Grand Central Station or a continental monopoly on sleeping car service. Big and complex entities like the Pullman Company deserve the kind of treatment that Rich is almost uniquely qualified to, to give. Over the years, I've worked on hundreds of projects uh, seeking to explain some part of railroad history. Too many times, video producers haven't known a bowling pin from a knuckle pin and didn't really care. They were interested only in spectacle and speed and uh, thought every railroad film of consequence really ought to end with a train wreck or a love scene. <laughs> Not Rich. He's a good friend, a splendid colleague, and one of the most accomplished filmmakers we have in the railroad community. We owe Kalmbach Publishing our thanks for having the courage, and it does take courage in today's corporate environment, to make these sorts of programs. Uh, they are almost unlike anything else out there in train world. And I'm delighted that Rich Luckman was able to be here and share at least some of the ways he creates his films. This is a rare treat. 
and I am truly looking forward to it. Rich, now it's your turn. Thank you very much, John. It's a very, very nice introduction. I want to thank, first of all, Scarlett and Ann, and, and particularly Jim Lilly, who made a special trip to Denver, which uh, he didn't have to do when he was in Albuquerque on a business trip, and we were able to videotape him in the studio. Uh, I would have liked very much to have come back and done it live uh, on the Dover Harbor, and I was scheduled to at least make a visit in January, and uh, I have never been as sick as I was those couple of days, and I called him or my wife called Jim and said, Rich is not coming. Uh, I mean, I was lucky that I could get out of bed, let alone get to the bathroom in time. Uh, so I was greatly disappointed that I couldn't see the Dover Harbor in person and meet the people that he wanted me to meet. Uh, having said that, uh, I like to think that uh, we have represented the Dover Harbor very well. As John said, uh, I don't do rail fan tapes. Uh, I do programs that sometimes are complicated. Uh, I like to think they're thorough, that they're complex, that they tell a story. And it's all about storytelling when you're doing these kinds of programs. Uh, Jim Wren called me the, the Ken Burns of railroad documentaries. And uh, I, I think that's great. I'm not sure I'm Ken Burns or his level. Well, he has a lot more resources than I do, but the resources we have, I think we, we do very well. And John Hankey has been one of my primary people that I always call and say, here's what I'm doing. Would you like to be involved? And good for you, John, you've never said no. <laughs> so uh, that really uh, makes the quality of the program is a lot better and gives them a lot of depth. I would like to thank on my epitaph, or I won't have a gravestone, I'm not arranged to do that, but that I help preserve and save American rail history. My specialty, of course, has been passenger trains and passenger train operations. And if you're familiar, in fact, you can see on the screen now, on the upper left is the, my first program I did in 1999, which was Silver Thread Through the West, the California Zephyr. And then the next one was Super Chief, and knowing that uh, Michael Gross was a Santa Fe fan, he was a natural to want to be involved in that. And then uh, American, the passenger trains, where I first met Pete Hansen, who I will talk about later. And then before this program, I had the pleasure of doing Journey to Promontory, and that was an interesting trip. Uh, we did 15 different trips, and uh, it was a challenge, but it, I think it worked out well. And the support of Columbach Publishing, too, for allowing me to uh, have total freedom. Uh, they never micromanaged me. Uh, I, I, they believed that I could do the job and, and let me do it. And, and the other good thing is they paid me <laughs> on time, too, so that, that's a good thing. This particular program is my 19th program. Most of all been about railroad, but I have to share one quick little thing with you all. My most popular program ever, sales-wise and interest-wise, was not about a train. It was about a classic automobile called Packard. Does anyone remember Packard? And I had the pleasure of working with the late Edward Herman, who was uh, the FDR and Eleanor and Franklin. I believe that was, uh, I don't remember what that, what that was on was a number of years ago. And what a nice gentleman who, the good part of it was he actually stored one. And so he could talk lovingly about a wonderful car. Um, my programs have become more complex as I've gone down this trail. I mean, when I did Silver Thread or Super Chief, you're dealing basically with one train. It goes from point A to point B. I may have had two sets or three sets of equipment, and you didn't have to do much more than that. Uh, when I did Promontory, and particularly when I did Pullman, the story was really much more about just building the cars. It was about the people who were involved with the cars, not only in the manufacturing, but in the operation and particularly the Pullman porters. There's a magic to traveling by train, especially at night, as the miles fade into the sunset. Before welded rail, the sound of the clickety-clack of the jointed rails provided the rhythm of the rails. It's hypnotic. Add the motion of the train, plus excellent onboard service, and you have a recipe for comfortable, safe travel. Pullman, America's Hotel on Wheels. 
I, I've got to uh, say a, a huge thank you to you as a chapter allowing me to use some of that footage that you had for your promotional and sales and marketing that's on your website. And what we did, I thought was so good that we married that together with vintage footage. And, uh, and we, we used the term, we dirtied up your footage a little bit and made it black and white so it would match the other footage that we had to uh, convey the, the story uh, with not only your footage, but historic footage as well. And that really sets the, the theme and the, and the idea of the program. In fact, that is our promo that when it gets on PBS, uh, that will be the 30-second promo that we'll, we will use. Uh, let's go. I think we can go now to uh, George Pullman. Interesting man. Um, loved and, and hated. Uh, and I have a few notes here. I'm not going to get into a lot of details because the program will certainly do that. But he was born in upstate New York. Well, that kind of piqued my interest right away because I was born in Syracuse, New York. And and brought up in Rochester, New York, and my wife's in Buffalo, New York, and actually where he was born was very near Buffalo, New York. Um, he was uh, started out poor, and uh, when he first started uh, moving buildings along the barge and uh, canal, uh, and apparently they must have changed the routing of the canal somewhat, and they had to move houses, and that's what he first started to do. And then he later went to Chicago, and they were going to elevate uh, all of the buildings in Chicago uh, so that uh, I guess when Lake uh, Michigan overflowed, uh, they wouldn't uh, be part of that. And then he heard about the gold mine, the gold mining gold discovered in Colorado. And uh, in, uh, I, don't, I don't have the exact date here, but he came out here to really seek his fortune. Now he was not gonna be digging for gold, but he was gonna be supplying the miners with supplies. And he did that uh, in Central City, uh, which is near Black Hawk. And if anyone knows, that's now a gambling uh, place. And I never go there because I think they wrecked the town. But uh, that's where he made his money. And actually, he had a cabin in Golden, Colorado, which is where I live. And unfortunately, uh, the cabin no longer exists. Well, it does in pieces, but uh, it no longer exists. So he made his money really uh, uh, with the, the gold and, and probably silver too as well. And of course, 1893, that all kind of went down the drain uh, with the uh, uh, you know, depression at that time. So he went back to Chicago and, uh, and, and, and he kind of figured out that as they say in the program that uh, traveling was, was not good either by stagecoach or very primitive uh, trains. And of course the, the trains and never even came to Colorado until 1869, 1870. And he just felt that he could do a better job uh, of what he saw. And of course, he built a couple of cars and out of coaches. And, and he, you know, went on for another 100 years uh, uh, to, uh, you know, better than 100 years to make real equipment. Um, they, they, of course, when you think of Pullman, and that's what I kind of enjoy, although I do center uh, and, and focus on the passenger operation, but they made almost every kind of rail vehicle that you could imagine. PCC trolleys, although they weren't big into that, trackless trolleys, obviously a lot of freight cars, like over a million. Uh, and I, I can't even tell you all of the different passenger cars that they made. And I had the good fortune of working with the Illinois Railway Museum, not in person, but uh, to be able to download uh, some of their images that they had that represent a lot of the equipment they made. And that's in a, a, a later chapter in the program. Uh, one of the uh, uh, real challenges that I'll be brief on, on making the program was COVID, you know, the pandemic. And I was lucky I did some interviews before all that hit, even before we had a budget. Uh, and Jim Wren uh, believed that we were going to do a program and I was in Florida to attend a car show, and uh, I had the occasion to interview uh, uh, Bill House, who's you know retired CSX uh, before that being O C N O uh, passenger director, and uh, I had the occasion to interview him while I was there. My last trip that I did, 
uh, was in March in Seattle, of all places, where the virus was there probably at that time in March. And I got out of there with the skin of my teeth. And uh, I'm just glad. And that was with, uh, I'm trying to thank Joe Welsh, that I had the occasion to interview him. Uh, but it was really a challenge working on this program more than any other I've ever had because for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I had to work remote with a studio. And thank goodness for Google File or whatever it was that he set up for me where I could put in all the photos for each particular different chapter uh, into uh, uh, that uh, Google Drive. That's what it is. And send it over to him and then he would do a rough cut he'd send it back and then I would take a look at it and, well, yeah, this is great. You need to change this or whatever. So uh, that was a challenge. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And let's go to the uh, Poem and Strike. Poem and Strike was probably one of the uh, most interesting strikes, early strike. Uh, it uh, occurred in uh, May 11th, uh, 1894 through July 20th, 1894, and that was a year after the silver crash in 1893. Uh, the strike was over wages and, uh, and working conditions, uh, but there was another union out there too that was trying to become involved, and that was the American Railway Union. Uh, that uh, didn't go anywhere, it, uh, it just uh, folded, but uh, they were trying to organize, and there was also a boycott of, of trains uh, that carried Pullman cars, and when the U.S. mail was affected, uh, that's when President Cleveland brought in troops to, uh, to uh, end the strike. And, of course, the unfortunate part is that there were a number of people killed. I believe it was like 13 people killed during the strike. Uh, it was nasty. Uh, and, of course, that's also uh, unhappiness with the t living in the town of Pullman, uh, where they, it was really a company town, 100%. And they just, uh, what's the right term I want to use, uh, uh, ruled everything. And of course, wherever you went, you bought, you worshipped, you, you uh, died, you were buried. I mean, they took care of everything. In fact, uh, Pete Hansen, in one part of the program, talks about a poem that was written by a Pullman employee. And I'm not going to recite it here because, well, number one, I can't remember it. But it's, it's kind of fun, but it's very truthful, too. And it's kind of an interesting part of our labor history. And, of course, they had a, an in-house union. And uh, that was merely a, a device to help pacify uh, the workers. But uh, I don't think they were satisfied with the, what their objectives were. And they weren't exactly the same as the uh, country. And at that time, of course, unions were not uh, well uh, respected or, or even encouraged. And, uh, and in fact, uh, if you were a Pullman porter, uh, when you were trying to unionize, and this really comes under A. Philip Randolph, uh, you, you would lose your job. I mean, there would be people on the train, as they would call spies, that would, any infraction at all, or even suggesting a union, uh, your career was ended right there. Let's go to A. Philip Randolph, the next slide. Very interesting man. Um, uh, interesting for me for a couple of reasons. One, he was born near the Jacksonville, Florida area. And I happen to have uh, three family members who live in Jacksonville. So it kind of piqued my interest. Um, he moved to uh, New York City and uh, he, he wanted to be an actor. And when you hear his voice in the program, you'll realize the reason why. Uh, the, he was dealing, of course, with the in-house union and they wanted a stronger voice than, than what the in-house union would allow them to have. And the union was started in 1925. Now, the union was actually, I think, started a couple of years before that, but 1925, he became involved. They were not recognized for 12 years. Imagine negotiating for 12 years until 1937. And the important part of the story, and we do include it, is many of the Pullman Porter's wives were really the ones behind uh, getting the news out to communicating to people because the Porter's couldn't do them themselves. I mean, they would lose their jobs. And so that was a very important thing. And the other interesting fact, and I'm, I'm not even sure we may get into 
do this in the program. I just don't remember. In 1942, A. Philip Randolph met with uh, President Roosevelt, and he wanted to have a march on Washington. And this was during the war, because he was unhappy with the type of jobs that the uh, African Americans were getting. I mean, it was kind of like sweep the floor or take the garbage out or whatever, and they wanted more responsible jobs. And Roosevelt uh, uh, decided that uh, it probably would be a good idea if he, uh, you know, uh, suggested or made recommendations that uh, the uh, African Americans would be uh, uh, elevated to more responsible jobs. And like I said before, he had a wonderful voice. Well, I never heard his voice. And uh, Bill Howes talks about it. And I'm trying to think, uh, uh, oh, there's a, we were lucky to interview a 101-year-old Pullman porter in Jacksonville. And I had heard about him and reached out to the Jacksonville Historical Society. And uh, lo and behold, he was a member of the society. And I couldn't go down there but I have a photographer friend that works at my brother's station. My brother is a uh, station manager for WJCT on the NPR side, but that's an unusual station because they also have the PBS uh, outlet as well. And so I worked by phone on the interview to interview uh, the 101 year old Porter. You can probably count on one hand the number of them that are alive today. And I'm just so fortunate that we, uh, we got him. So we're in the studio and everybody's talking about how wonderful his voice is. And I'm saying, what the hell does his voice sound like? And so we searched and that's the great thing with the internet. I mean, you've got the world at your fingers. You just have to make sure that what you're getting is accurate and true. And um, we found a wonderful clip of about 30 seconds. And he, remember, he was going to uh, organize the, uh, the March on Washington in 1942, while well, he was one of the organizers for the March in Washington in 19, what was it, 64, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and he was credited with that. And he, uh, we found a clip of him, about a 30 second clip. We had to pay for it, one free. And you realize when you hear him, the wonderful uh, voice that he had, and you know, yeah, he could have been a good actor reading Shakespeare or whatever. Uh, Let's move on uh, to innovations. Like anything, you know, in, in the world, we innovate, we hopefully we improve, we make it better, faster, whatever. And uh, of course, air conditioning was a, was a big luxury uh, that Pullman was involved in. Uh, and they worked with George Westinghouse on that. And I can't imagine, uh, of course, I don't live in the South. Uh, we are pretty dry out here. So a 90 degree day doesn't feel like 90 degrees in, Miami, Florida, but imagining traveling without air conditioning. I guess it was windows and cinders and whatever. Uh, and the interesting part of uh, air conditioning was that it was not in a sleeping car, the first one, it was in a dining car uh, for cleanliness and, and uh, I didn't know that either. Uh, the other big deal was enclosed vestibules that uh, Pullman was very much involved with. and. Uh, imagine walking in between the cars without that. That would be kind of a dangerous situation. And if you were all at all, uh, uh, you know, had a problem with mobility, uh, uh, that could end up in, in disaster. Here's something I didn't really know much about either. Paper wheels. Anybody ever hear about paper wheels? And I don't, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail because I don't know a lot about it either, but Anyway, uh, I do show some diagrams regarding what that was, and supposedly it was going to be a much quieter ride. I am told that the PCCs in Washington, D.C. had those uh, to make them quieter, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I never lived in Washington. I couldn't tell you. I'm sure one of you people would know that. And like I say, air conditioning in 1929 was a huge deal, and... Uh, and then, of course, the, the wonderful thing about Pullman was their ability to uh, uh, work with the railroads and just moving the cars around. I can't imagine today uh, how they did that before computers. When you think that in the late 20s, they were carrying 100,000 people a night. Can you imagine what it took to, one, have cars available in all of the materials and bedding and 
whatever uh, for each car, and and not only that, but crewing them as well. So it was quite uh, quite a thing. Uh, it just proves that they were very good at what they did. And one of the reasons why I think they're good, I'm going off script here a little bit, is that they had a consistency of service. And whenever you got on a Pullman car, there was no surprise. You knew what you were going to get. And if you look at their training manuals or whatever, just serving a martini or something is a multiple, uh, you know, purpose uh, uh, thing to do. And, uh, and I think that's really what uh, uh, had them stand above everything else was their standard of quality. Uh, you, there's no surprise there. Let's move on. Okay. Oh, I love that photo. I knew it existed. I had seen it before. And here's where, you know, working with Colin Bach, but you have a wonderful library. And <clears throat> pardon me, I visit there a couple of times a year when I do a program. And I said, you've got this whole line of troop sleepers. And I think it's a cab forward on the head end. You can't really tell from here. Uh, and I got to have that photo. And uh, I think the, the, the time that Pullman just shined was during World War II, the amount of passengers that they hauled and my good late friend Peter Hansen gets into the mileage and the number of people that uh, travel on the train. And, and uh, you know, there was a porter for each one of those cars, believe it or not. And I'm trying to think, like, I think they held, and again, it's in the program, uh, 32 people plus the porter. And I, I can be corrected on that. But uh, it was a wonderful uh, movement of people. And, and uh there were 2,400 troop sleepers, and I think Pullman probably made most of them. Uh, and the one thing that I found, we found a lot of good footage, a lot of what we call stock footage that we could buy, and a lot of movement of the soldiers on the trains. And some of the most poignant uh, images in the program are the images of uh, final images of sweethearts saying goodbye, and someone we would never see each other again. And we end that chapter with that thought. If you just think about that, uh, it's quite uh, bringing you to tears. So that was a, probably the, the height of uh, Pullman in terms of traveling uh, by rail. And I need to take a drink of water because I'm getting dry. Let's move on. Another big deal, of course, in the company, and again, I'm not going to get into exact details because the program does that well, but Bud was an up and coming car manufacturer. And of course, with the streamlined trains of, I think, 1934 with the M10,000 on UP and, and the uh, Burlington Zephyr on the Burlington. And there was the Minuteman and uh, GM&O had the Rebel and there were all these small uh, little trains. But uh, Bud, of course, had patented this shot welding uh, operation. And you know what's really interesting, I'll just digress a little bit. When Amtrak came into being, they wanted Bud cars. They, believe it or not, they did not want Pullman cars. And there are still Bud cars around, still operating, not on Amtrak. But uh, they were built like iron and, and just stayed up and, and, and had millions of miles on them. Uh, but in 1940, I believe it was, Bud uh, issued or, or filed a lawsuit with the federal government in regard of uh, trade uh, and, and they claimed, and I think they probably were right, that Pullman was a monopoly. Uh, not only did they manufacture the cars, they operated them as well. And so that, uh, of course, during the war, uh, really not much uh, happened. Uh, but after the war, I think it was 1947, of course, well, before that, they had to decide that they were going to split the company. You could either do one or the other. And they chose to manufacture, which is probably the smart thing to do because they could probably see the writing on the wall that the passenger rail service was going to go down after World War II. It was never going to be what it was in the 30s and, and during the war. And uh, in 1947, uh, they sold the cars to a consortium of 59, 57 railroads in the beginning, ended up being 59, and they actually owned the cars, but Pullman under a contract uh, did uh, service and crew the cars uh, pretty much right up to the, uh, to the end. And I was very, very lucky to find, and again, what I'm emphasizing here is the research that goes into these, these things. It's just, uh, if I totaled my hours, which I have not, I'm probably working for about 25 cents an hour. 
And John, I think you can relate to that when it comes to, uh, and I got to have another drink of water here. Anyway, uh, yeah, we, well, we found, I, yeah, okay. We found some great footage uh, from a film called Streamline Trains. In fact, I got that years ago from the NRHS library uh, when you could get film. I don't know how much of it's available now uh, of them actually making the car and welding it and all of that. So that's just a real bonus to, to find that kind of stuff. And, and like I said, I'll regress a little bit or digress. It's the research and it's, it's asking the right questions and it's not taking, you know, the first answer, looking for verification or whatever. And uh, I had over 200 files of images for the Pullman program. Now, grant you, some files may only have five or six images, others would have 40 and 50, so that we had more than enough to support the visuals of those who were talking in the program. You know, talking heads are not terribly interesting. Uh, so you really need to cover them up with a lot of good images that support what they're talking about. And that's basically what those 200 film or files did along with all the film and video that we had acquired. Let's move on to uh, the post-war trains. This, of course, started out as the train of tomorrow, and that made a, a tour, a countrywide tour, and I believe it was for, like, for two years. Uh, and UP ended up buying it and it went into service, I believe, between Portland and Seattle. Uh, I don't know what they call the train. I should know, but I don't. And uh, I think one of those cars still survives somewhere in a barn up in Utah somewhere, so I am told. Um, but the, the first post-war train was the Pierre Marquette. And uh, that would have been, I think, in 1947, I think. And uh, that was the first real post-streamline. There were streamline trains made before the war. Of course they were. But after the war, and of course the railroad started ordering uh, the equipment before the war ended because we could see that, you know, it was going to come to a conclusion in 1945, or at least hopefully. Um, and the, of course, the train of tomorrow uh, made a tour. Uh, and then, of course, the dome car. And that's got to be probably the most delightful car to travel in. And I've done a lot of miles in a dome car. And the very first one, well, some would argue that there was something similar to that in Canada, e even before that. Uh, but the first one was called the Silver Dome, and uh, I believe we show a picture of that. And that was a coach that was converted in the Burlington shops. And believe it or not, I think it made a run between Chicago and Lincoln. Uh, let me tell you, there's not a whole lot of scenery uh, between those two points. And of course, before the California Zephyr, which is the most famous of all dome car trains, was a, a dome car train from uh, the uh, Twin Cities down to Chicago. And that's a beautiful line that I had the occasion to ride on a Burlington special a number of years ago with a Lexington group. And uh, it's just spectacular. But uh, there's nothing like a dome car. And I like them at night just as well, maybe even more. You sit up there and you got the first seat and you can watch the train and get to the last dome car and watch the signals change from red to green to red. Uh, it's just magical. Uh, and the superliners, the lounge cars are nice, but they're not dome cars. I mean, they're, they got big windows, that's good, but you can't look out ahead of you or, or behind you. And uh, anyway, that was a huge innovation. Of course, the California Zephyr was inaugurated in 1949. And uh, I'm trying to think there was a slogan for that train, the most, well, not the most beautiful train in the world. That was daylight. Uh, but look around, look up, look down, look around. I think that was kind of their, their slogan for the Zephyr. And of course, if the Zephyr could have only lasted until 1971 with Amtrak, it came off in 1970. And I took the last shots of the last train in Denver as it left east. And you know, there's always a sad thing when you watch that train leave that you'll never see it again. And I've been to too many train off uh, situations where that happened. So it's kind of a sad thing. Uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll go to more post-war trains, and I'm sure many of you know more about this than I do. Uh, I don't think it was a tremendous success, uh, and of course for the uh, the Chessy, uh, those cars uh, never did uh, go into service. So uh, They were split up, and I think some of them ended up on the Rio Grande, if I recall, 
uh, I think youth maybe on the prospector and then the DNH ended up getting a couple of them for the Laurentian under Buck Moraine, or, or uh, I'm trying to think uh, the president of, uh, of the um, DNH at that time. Um, and then of course, one car that I think is just amazing is what we know as a sleeper coach, but Bud called it the siesta coach. That's what that was called originally. And uh, Pullman called theirs a slumber coach. Now keep in mind that the New York Central called theirs a sleeper coach because they couldn't use the word slumber coach. And there were a number of railroads that operated them, SAL, UP, well, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I know New York Central did, Northern Pacific did. Uh, Mopac actually rented or leased a car, but they never ever bought it. And that was toward the end when things were kind of going south. Uh, but I can remember uh, being at a slumber coach on the Denver Zephyr because I could afford it. Uh, and, and but I could use the diner, I could use the observation lounge, which was either the Silver Verenda or Silver Chateau. Wonderful cars. And I, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, when I lived in Chatham, New York, if you know where that is, it's on the old Boston and Albany, uh, I would watch, and I could see it from my house, the New England states every night, okay, going west. And if I were going to go to Chicago, of course, I could take that train, and I would watch, and I could see by the window, uh, what do I want to say, uh, window uh, uh, pattern, that either there was or there was not a slumber coach operating on that train. And uh, quite often, I would make a reservation for the slumber coach and the uh, wouldn't be on the train. And I would know that and I'd get a regular, uh, you know, roomette or whatever for the same price. So that was kind of like watching the railroad every night. A uh, great car, they would seat or sleep 40 uh, passengers. And what's really amazing is that, you know, even on the New York Central, which I was most familiar with, uh, a, a long distance car would be uh, 48 uh, seats. And here you could sleep 40. Where did they all go? Why don't we have them now? Uh, I can't even afford to travel in a sleeper on Amtrak anymore with the cost that they have, but I guess they fill them up. And that's why they run them. The Hollywood Beach, interesting car. I used to belong to Aprico, and you know what Aprico is all about. Uh, American Association of Private Rail Car Owners, and that's a wonderful car. It always shows up, and that was their answer to the dome car. Well, that's not really a dome car, but uh, that was their answer, and uh, because of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, not being able to use the dome cars on the on the East Coast. I, I, there are probably some exceptions, but uh, uh, anyway, that was their answer, and that, that was built, I believe, in 1956. It was very late in the Pullman uh, operation. And actually, the last sleeping cars were built for the Seaboard Airline, which this is a good ex example of that, and Union Pacific in 1956, and they had a whole series of cars. In fact, I uh, worked with the UP Museum and uh, Council Bluffs, and they were able to supply me with a photo of one of the cars from that lot. And of course, we were all surprised, and I lived back east at that time, in 1965, the Kansas City Southern actually bought 10 inner city coaches. And they were pretty Spartan inside, but they uh, loved the paint job on the outside for their, I guess it would be their Southern Bell. They, they, were, they weren't running much more uh, than that. And then they didn't last very long and they bailed. But uh, yeah, that, that was the last of them. However, really the last passenger cars made by Pullman were the Superliner ones. In fact, the very last car that we have a picture of on the uh, transfer table is George M. Pullman, named for George M. Pullman. And I should go back and say there is a car named A. Philip Randolph, and you'll love this. The word Philip is misspelled on the car. It has two L's. It always should have one L for the word Philip. Somebody didn't do their homework on that one. Well, you know, like anything, uh, there's never one thing that really causes any demise of any product or service or whatever. Uh, you know, when Eisenhower signed the interstate highway bill, I think that would have been 1956 or whatever. I can remember riding my bicycle on the New York State Thruway near Rochester before it was open. I thought that was pretty cool. But 
And another thing that just I reminded me when I interviewed John Kinnefick, uh, who worked for the New York Central and later, of course, became chairman of the board of UP. And when I interviewed him in Omaha, he said, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Buffalo. And when I drove my daughter and my wife to Buffalo in, on the interstate highway in my whatever, 58 Chevy, whatever it was, he said, I knew the end was coming because we just weren't going to survive. And of course, they didn't. Uh, New York Central and Penn Central, of course, inaugurated, inaugurated Empire Service, which is really still running today on Amtrak. Uh, but the last thing that really killed off, well, before that would be 1958 with the 707 and the DC-8. And when the uh, Pullman Company lost the business traveler, particularly the New York, Chicago business, that really spelled the end. And when you could fly out of LaGuardia on a, you know, 707 and get to Chicago in two and a half hours, three hours, why would you take the train? Now, you don't have to argue with me. I would take the train. In fact, when I took the train to Chicago every year, my boss flew and he says, I don't care how you get there, just get there when I need you. And so I traveled on my time to get there to experience. And that's the one time I rode to 20th Century Limited, uh, which was just a, a great experience, even toward the end. But it was the loss of the mail in 1967. And I won't get into a lot of detail, but Joe Welsh does a real fine job of, uh, of really telling, it was like 160 different trains that carried mail. And he recites the number of trains and, and uh, you know, the amount of mail that was, that was uh, carried. And, you know, often that was the only thing that, that, that provided a break-even point for the railroad was carrying the mail. And, of course, Railway Express. Of course, REA is gone now, too. And that was really the end. When the mail car came off, that was the railroad would petition to, uh, to get rid of it. Uh, and then... Uh, and then it all went to either trucks or planes, and you know we we all know the history of that. Uh, beautiful. I mean, I love aircraft too. Beautiful plane. I don't think there's a better looking plane than a Connie. Uh, and like I said before, uh, they really grabbed the business for the businessman out of New York to Chicago. But you know that was not new. Flying and and riding a train that started back. Uh, in 1929 or 28 uh, with the Airway Limited with the Pensy and the Santa Fe. And you would travel overnight on the train and of course uh, travel daylight uh, by plane. And of course, I'm not sure they traveled above the weather. So it could be kind of a, a bumpy ride. Uh, but of course the depression came and that was the end of that experiment. We do show a sequence in the program uh, showing the train and the plane and and how it worked. And that was an interesting experiment. And in fact, one of my favorite shots, and you, you'll kill me for this, being real fans, is the guy we interviewed underneath the nose of a TWA Connie in Kansas City. It's just a gorgeous shot. And, uh, but anyway, that was, that was kind of the end right there. Yeah, I'm just looking here. Uh, yeah, the 20th century, of course, was the businessman's train. Maybe, and you'll argue with me on this, maybe even more than the Broadway. 20th century was a New York train. Uh, and in their heyday, you know, 16 hours, 17, 18 hours, nothing was finer than the 20th century. Uh, but I remember the last day, it was December 5th, I think, 19, I can't remember, 65, 66, 67, somewhere in there. John, you probably know better than I, than I on that one. Um, when it came off, and of course, the railroad did not announce it ahead of time. It's kind of like, we ain't running it tomorrow. But what they did run is that uh, uh, number train 61, I think, uh, took its place with virtually the same equipment without the observation car and without a twin unit diner. So they still had uh, service between New York and Chicago. Yeah. Oh, what a car. Uh, I'll be brief on that. I, I was attending the big hobby show, uh, I think it's by the Amherst uh, Railroad Society in West Springfield. And a friend of mine from Denver, I had lunch with, he said, you know, there's a car up in, in Vermont you ought to know about, and it's called the Sunbeam. So when I got home, I was staying with a good buddy of mine. I called him up and said, I'd love to come up and see that car. And so we, we shot a number of images. 
and that's on the Lincoln Estate uh, up in Vermont, Manchester, Vermont. A wonderful, beautiful car, wooden car, and uh, we do show, in fact, I interviewed a guy, and I wasn't even planning on interviewing, and uh, I interviewed him off my phone, believe it or not, and actually turned out pretty good, so I think you'll enjoy that. This is in the bonus footage. And then I have a section, uh, I'm just collecting Pullman, and I'm sure I don't, I didn't get all the different things you could collect, but from blankets to uh, stir straws to uh, Pullman key to China to silverware, uh, playing cards, uh, you name it. It's a section in there. We just set the music uh, and just show the collectible items. And it's just a fun section uh, to look at and maybe uh, compare what you have in your collections. Uh, I've got probably 50 or 60 ads that I, again, are just putting in there as a bonus footage thing. Uh, and it's such a variety. And they did a great job of advertising throughout the years from, from the 20s right on through to the, I would say, 50s. Uh, not too much beyond that point because they, they went out of business, I believe, in 68 and closed down. Well, they didn't really close down. It took a number of years for them to close down in 69. One of my biggest disappointments, of course, was losing a, a very good friend, uh, uh, Pete Hansen, and uh, we flew him out. He lives, he lived in Winter Park, Florida, and we flew him out in January. And uh, he is just one of the shots, a screen uh, grab that we got with him. And he just talks about the, the wonderful travel of Pullman and the uh, Pullman porters and what they were all about. and and. Uh, Anyway, uh, he died several months later of brain cancer and uh, such a loss to the hobby uh, is, a, is a fine historian. And of course, Pete was the editor of Railroad History, uh, which I think is one of the finest publications out there. So it was a, a great loss to, to lose him. And we had worked on a number of programs, 20th Century, uh, American to Passenger Train. Uh, we did Amtrak's 40th anniversary program, I was hired by Amtrak to do that. And few people have seen that uh, because uh, PBS thought it was a little too self-serving of a program about Amtrak. Well, of course it was. It was all about Amtrak and Amtrak paid me to do it. So, uh, but the, the neat part about that trip was that I got to travel on Amtrak for a month and uh, literally all over the country interviewing mayors and uh, historians and uh, from coast to coast uh, I felt like I was a commuter on the Zephyr and the Capital Limited going to Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was a great experience. And it really uh, served one of my objectives, and that was to actually do a program for a real railroad rather than just, you know, for myself or whatever. So that is really about what I have to say. And we are doing about 24 minutes. So I'm open to any questions. Yeah, hi, this is Scarlett again. Um, everybody tee up any questions you have in the chat feature, and I've got two or three teed up already from John Hankey. Number one, Rich, what was your first ride in a sleeping car? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I would say probably on the New York Central, on the New England States. Uh, I was a young adult, and uh, I just thought it was marvelous. And particularly when you were traveling on the New York Central at that time with a four-track main line, I was just amazed how they kind of weaved us in in between everything else. And uh, that's when they cared and that's when they ran on time. But I would say that would be my first one. And you know, the, the neat thing about it is you go into a room at or whatever, and I was always fascinated by all the switches, you know, and, the, and the, there's a call button there and the fan with the rubber blades. Uh, yeah, and of course, you want to try them all. And of course, at night to be a blue, you could turn on the blue light. Uh, the only thing that I didn't like uh, was the fact that in some of those cars, you had to lift up the bed in the middle of the night if you had to use the john. And that was not exactly convenient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Step out in the hallway. But uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I love traveling by train, but I think I'm getting to the age I don't want to travel by coach anymore. So that was my, that I can remember. We still have that feature today in the Dover Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, turning to uh, the film you just completed and all your research, what sense did you ultimately form about George M. Pullman as a person and a businessman? I thought it was an SOB. 
<laughs> he was brilliant. He was brilliant. I mean, he took an idea. Of course, he, he gobbled up everybody by 1900. He had all the companies with the exception of, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, I can't think of it now, one company that they did, they, they did grab. But uh, yeah, I mean, Wagner probably made better sleeping cars even than Pullman, so I am told. Uh, he was a genius. I thought he really thought he was doing a good thing with the town of Pullman, you know, that happy workers would be productive workers. And that worked for a while, uh, but uh, not for ever. And of course, he's buried under concrete, so no one can dig him up uh, when he died. And he died only, I don't know, three or four years after the strike. I mean, I think the strike broke him as well as it did, uh, you know, the union. So. Uh, uh, a brilliant man, uh, and probably uh, no one was better in planning and executing uh, and organizing than he was. And, you know, in history, he was probably the right guy at the right time. So that's my take on him. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got quite a few to choose from. Um, so when you are making a, a railroad film like this, Mm -hmm. What's it like on the road? How many miles or days uh, does, oh. are you on the road traveling? Yeah, it gets to be old after a while. Uh, my videographer, who's just retired, uh, and I, I know I'm going to be working with my editor, and he's a very good videographer. We travel with four cases of equipment, each weighing 50 pounds each. And uh, when we check curb check, which we can do here in Denver, and you can do it in many cities, I have an uh, international photographer's press card and of course my ID, and uh, this might sound like a bribe because it is, and there's always a $5 bill kind of attached to all of that. So if we're a pound over, nobody kind of worries about it. And uh, we take nothing but non-stops. We will not do a connection because what if we get to wherever and we didn't, the, the luggage didn't make it. And we have an interview set up the next day. We always go out a day early. We come back sometimes the last day of the shoot or the next day. I would say the part, I'm kind of a one person operation. I'm a travel agent. I line up the talent. Uh, I help carry the equipment. Uh, it's a pain, but uh, just planning the trip and making it all come together with the airline. We fly a lot on Southwest because we can each check two bags for free. Okay. My wife is retired Frontier Airlines, so we can check one free, one carry on and we get a really reduced rate, but who's flying today? I don't want to fly today. But I would say that would be it. Uh, if we do three or four interviews in a day, that's a day, because it takes sometimes longer to do the setup than it does the interview. Uh, what I have to do in advance is to submit the questions to the interviewee so that we're not, they're not surprised. Uh, and then while Mark, my videographer, is setting up everything, I keep them occupied by talking to them so they don't see or worry about what's going on around them. Um, and we just try to be friendly. Uh, and I got to say that probably most everybody we've ever interviewed is very cooperative. However, there's always one or two who don't make the program for whatever reason. On uh, the Pullman, everybody made it on this one. But there have been in the past where... You know, it's, it's easy for me to be behind the camera. It's not easy to be in front of the camera. And some people get real tongue-tied or they can't speak in a complete sentence. And, you know, my job is to make everybody look and feel good. And that means sound good, look good, feel good. And when we leave, we want it to be a good experience for them. And, of course, we always have them sign a release. Otherwise, we don't use it and we put their name in the credits, and we send them a DVD, and that's it. We pay nobody. I had somebody want to try to extort me into, well, you need to pay me. Like hell, I'm going to pay you. <laughs> I didn't say it that way. We ain't paying. You have to have a love of history, and you want to share it with us. Sure, Colin Bach's making money off of it. Sure, I make some, not much, but we're saving history. And I always feel like if you're old enough, do you remember Beat the Clock with Bud Collier or whatever? I'm always feeling that I'm playing beat the clock because, man, I'll tell you, every year I get a notice that somebody I interviewed died. And here we are. We saved that story. It's like World War II soldiers 
we save their stories when they're gone, because when they're gone, they're not going to remember any of this. That was a long answer. <clears throat> All right. Um, I've got a couple of quick ones, I think. Uh, someone wants to know, when was your first ride in a Pullman car? Okay, well, that was on the New England States, okay, years ago. And which railroad had the most Pullman cars in their passenger fleet? Well, that's something that I don't get into the program, okay? <laughs> you know, I got to tell you real, real quick. This is my disclaimer. This program will not have everybody's favorite Pullman. It will not have enough of the Dover Harbor. And it will not have those kinds of facts because I'm also uh, looking at a PBS audience who could care less. I would say probably between the New York Central and the Pensy had the most and Maybe Santa Fe after that would have the most Pullman cars, but I'm sure you have, have, have experts in your group that will know a lot more than I do. But just the volume of trains on the Penn State and New York Central would tell me that they probably had the most. All right. We've got about time for one more, and I think uh, John Hankey has given us, there's so many good ones, but I'm going to pick this one because I think it's something that would be interesting to all of us. If someone handed you a blank check and told you to do a film or a series about railroad heritage that you think needs to be done, what would it be about? Well, I have an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For years, I have wanted to do a program about America's great railway stations. And I'm in the process right now. In fact, I know I sent the promo and remind me to send it to you. Oh, uh, yes. We did a two minute promo to convince trains it would be a good idea. And I think it's spectacular. John, you can speak to that. You, John's seen it, okay? John Hankey wrote the script for the opening of a possible new program. And it's magnificent. And I think that's a program. I, w I want to call it America's Cathedrals, but you know, the times you live in right now, somebody will get bench and oh you're equating that to a church and whatever i don't want to go there so i just said all aboard america's great railway stations i think that's what the title is but that's the one i want to do all right well we're, we are right at 8 30 and i think that is a great way to end this program with the teaser for things to come Good. um the DVD that Rich has been talking about tonight is available from Combat Now, Pullman, America's Hotel on Wheels. I just received my copy. It's hot off the presses. I haven't even had time <laughs> to watch huh? it yet. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank you and the folks for Combat for putting this out. Um, it's going to be a, a great resource and a treat for a lot of us. Well, I got to uh, plug, I gotta plug the, the, the book to the magazine. I just got yes. mine two days ago. It did a nice job. Uh, yes, I have mine too, and it is still shrink wrapped. <laughs> yeah, well, and they got and they got a nice timeline in there too, which I always like those, and I've often wanted to do that in a program, but we just don't have the time or the the ability to do that and be effective. So anyway, which well, was my pleasure to uh, chat with you all. I hope that you enjoyed it, that you learned something, and I hope that you will uh, buy a copy of the DVD. <laughs> Yes. Well, thank you, Rich, for putting this together for us and spending, spending your time with us tonight. It has really been a fantastic program and a real treat. Well, this is the first um, time I've done anything like this, so I was a little apprehensive, but if you know your subject, I think you can fake your way through. So, anyway. Well, I would be remiss without saying a special thank you to our production team, Ann Mason and Gary Goldsmith. They are the ones who make these po programs possible mm -hmm. and who... Um, make it possible for them to go onto YouTube in such a nice way um, so that we can expand the audience. Good. So I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we really enjoy these programs. I hope you have too. And I just want to say thanks in particular to Wes from the Railroad Collectors Association for getting the word out and uh, to any of you folks who were there as well. I will say one more thank you both to Rich and to John, to our production team, and to all of you all who have been here tonight. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.